Welcome back, Everyday Americans. You've rejoined the Constitution Study today. It is my pleasure to have the author of the new book, Consent, uh, uh, Silence Equals Consent, The Sin of Omission, Speak Now or Forever Lose Your Freedom, William Federer. William, thank you for joining us here at the Constitution Study. Hey, it's great to be with you. Yeah, I, I must admit, I hadn't heard of you before until I found out about your book, uh, so why don't you tell my audience just a little bit about you and what you do, and then we'll talk more about your book. Sure. Well, I've written about 30 books. Um, one, my first one, America's God and Country Encyclopedia of Quotations, sold over half a million copies. And uh, I've written a book on the history of Islam, the history of uh, socialism. and But this one is Silence Equals Consent, the Sin of Omission. And uh, the... Um, Quick overview as I go through the founding of America. You had two waves of pastors and churches. The first were the Puritans, and they had a covenant form of government where everybody was involved, both in church and in state. So you had churches founding cities. So Roger Williams, a Baptist pastor, founded the city of Providence, Rhode Island, with his Baptist church, actually the first Baptist church in America. And a pastor, Thomas Hooker, and his Congregationalist church founded a city, Hartford, Connecticut. And in New England, you had pastors and churches founding cities. You know, John Wheelwright uh, founded uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, and, you know, Barnesville, Massachusetts. I mean, all these different ones. And, um, uh, and they got their inspiration from the Bible, what part of the Bible that first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul? It's called the Hebrew Republic. And it's the first instance in world history of millions of people and no king, right? So king is the norm. Nimrod, Nimrod, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar, uh, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan. And they keep getting bigger and bigger because with the latest military advancements, kings can kill more people. Instead of cane killing able with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon, iron weapon, big long phalanx spear, gunpowder. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. So Augustus Caesar wanted a worldwide tracking system. Anyway, they keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and whatever the king believes, the kingdom has to believe. Uh, but these uh, Calvinist Puritans uh, look back to this pre King Saul period of Israel. So we're on 1400 BC, millions of Israel Israelites come out of Egypt, and for 400 years, there's no king. It's called the Hebrew Republic. And it works because everybody's taught the law and personally accountable to God to follow it. And so this was studied by the founders of America. In Israel's case, it worked until the priests stopped teaching the law. Every man did what was right in their own eyes, and they get King Saul. Now, why is that important? Because the kings of Europe looked to the Bible, but they looked to the King Saul and on. They wanted a theocracy. You got to believe the way the king's government does, or you get canceled. You lose your job. You, you get burnt at the stake, right? You get put in prison. Um, and so they had this top down, but the founders of America, they wanted to bottom up. They looked to the pre-King Saul part of the Bible. Now, why is this important? Because Romans 13, which says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Romans 13 is understood differently in a monarchy versus a republic. Mm -hmm. In a monarchy, subjects submit to the king. In a republic, the citizens are the king. The politicians are your servants, public servants. You hire them, you fire them, right? It's a top-down versus bottom-up, right? And so this is important because the pastors and churches say, oh, you got to submit to the government. They need to go over to China and submit to Xi Jinping, right? When, it, when the government blows the trumpet, <laughs> they bow to the statue. Uh, America's founders are like, no, we're the pre-kings all part of the Bible, where, where, where each individual is taught the law and personally accountable to God to follow it. So, yeah. so that's the 1600s. And then I contrast it with the 1700s. I was going to say, you know, it, it's interesting. You're, you're saying a lot of what I've been talking about in different terms. You know, it's like I've, I've studied the Bible for decades. So when you're talking about the judges, the period of the judges, which is how I'd always heard it, not as a, the Hebrew Republic. But yeah, I keep thinking, so Israel messes up and God gives them a judge to save them, and then they mess up again. you know. But he's right. It, it was the point where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Kind of like saying, I feel like a girl today. You know, I'm just going to do what's right in my own, and it never worked out well. But you're right. You know, in a, in a republic, we, the people, are the sovereign. We hire people to represent us in government. We are 
the 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 leaders that we should be submitting to. And I always got to go back to uh, uh, it was a Peter and John before the the Sanhedrin going. You tell me, do we follow you or do we follow God? That's where we were going to follow God. Yeah. So after a century of this Puritan congregational covenant church teaching in New England, it got a little dry. And to some, it was not just a good plan. It was only a plan. And at Harvard and Yale, they would they would teach sort of academically. Okay, God has a plan for your life, your marriage, your family, church, government. Find out what the plan is, put it into place. Some took it the next step and said, God in his infinite wisdom already knows who's going to wind up in heaven, so don't even bother preaching the gospel. And they became unevangelistic. Whoever's going to get saved, they'll get saved. And David Brainerd was expelled from Yale for saying his professor was as spiritual as a chair. And so by this time, the Puritans were nicknamed Old Lights, and the Revivalists were nicknamed New Lights. And these Revivalists said, look, being a Christian is more than a plan. Even if it's a good plan, you have to have an experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change, and you won't do worldly things anymore, like go to bars and brothels and get involved in government. It's like, wait, what was that last thing? The government's <laughs> worldly. If you're really Christian, you won't be involved in worldly government. Well, gee, this is different because for a century, you've had everybody involved in church and everybody involved in government because it was the churches founding the cities. They had to be involved. There was no like non-church member to be lazy and let them run stuff. But now they're teaching, no, 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 don't be involved in government. It's worldly. And so uh, I see where this came from. Well, Germany, 1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation because he had a personal experience with Jesus. The just shall live by faith, that righteousness is not something you earn, it's a gift. And um, so Martin Luther was willing to stand up to the most powerful government leader, the King of Spain, Charles V, and tell him to his face, unless you can prove me wrong from Scripture, here I stand, so help me God. It's very personal. But some German princes have been waiting for a chance to break from Rome. And they go, this is my chance. Kingdom of mine, I just decided you are all now Lutherans. And the people are like, okay, great, we're Lutheran. Uh, what do we believe? So for the people in the kingdom, it's not the same personal experience necessarily. And so a, a revival movement starts called pietism. Said being a Christian is more than doctrine. Even if it's good doctrine, you have to have an experience with Jesus. When you do, your life will change. You won't do worldly things anymore like bars and brothels and government. So where the pietists say you can do two things. You can be involved in government of the church and you can be involved in the civil government. You can be a spouse and you can be a parent. Two completely different roles. One person can do both. You can be a king and a priest. Whereas the pietists are like, no, 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 government's worldly. You can only do one. You have to pick. And if you're real spiritual, you're going to withdraw from worldly government and just be involved in the church. Well, that brings up an interesting scenario. Because if all the spiritual people withdraw from government, who's left to be involved in the government but the less spiritual and since they're less spiritual, they're going to yield in their ambitions and become tyrants. And four centuries of that teaching in Germany allowed Hitler to put Jews on train cars. And they're going right past the church crying for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government doing that. Mm -hmm. And we're the church and we can't get involved. And so that um, is the um, uh, the danger of, uh, uh, of the church wanting to be um, pulled back is you're, you're creating a vacuum. And so that's what um, the the founders of America didn't want. They didn't want the church doing nothing. So, um, you know, looking at the at the table of contents for your uh, your book, you start right off with this idea of Christian nationalism, which a lot of people use as a pejorative. Personally, I'm yeah, that's me. I I've been a Christian for decades, for most of my adult life. In fact, all of my adult life, but uh, I'm also a patriot. I also care about the Constitution and the states. And, you know, when did the idea of being both a believer in God and wanting what's best for our nation, our country, our, our neighbors become a bad thing? About a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Christian nationalism. The first thing to point out is nationalism is the opposite of globalism. There are globalists who mm -hmm. want a one world government. The first director of the World Health Organization, 
Many people have heard of the World Health Organization. The first director, Brock Chisholm, said to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their national patriotism. So lo and behold, globalists do not like people that want to preserve their nation. Secondly, national, nationalism depends on the nation to decide whether it's good or bad. In socialist Islamist nations, there's no individual rights. Right. I mean, ask the Jews in, in Germany, right? The National Socialist Workers Party, no individual rights. But in America, our nation is to guarantee to each person the rights from a creator, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of conscience, freedom, right, to possess and bear arms, freedom to a speedy trial of a jury of your peers, right? So, and to top it all off, we're a nation where it's government from the consent of the governed. You get to be in charge. That's sort of a good thing, right? So nationalism is bad in socialist and Islamist nations because there's no individual rights. Preserving our nation is good because it preserves individual rights. And uh, But finally, nationalism, Christian nationalism used to be called Christian patriotism. I have an 1828 dictionary. The word nationalism is not in there. The word patriotism is love of one's country. Mm -hmm. And so George... Washington in Valley Forge said to the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. Lincoln's inaugural address, he said, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. He mentions patriotism and Christianity right next to each other in his inaugural. Franklin Roosevelt gave out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers in World War II. Could you imagine a president giving out a New Testament? <laughs> Millions of them. And he wrote the foreword, as commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible. I wonder if the mainstream media would call Franklin Roosevelt a Christian nationalist. So I prefer the term that's been used historically, it's Christian patriot. But why do they want to call Christian patriots Christian nationalists? Negative word association. Why do they call pro-life people anti-abortion? There's no pro-life group that calls itself anti-abortion group. But the, every single mainstream news article will call pro-life people anti-abortion. Why? Negative word association. That word anti mm -hmm. has a negative connotation. Why do they call Christian patriots Christian nationalists? Negative word association. What a boogeyman, right? And so why don't you call us what we want to be called, right? Christian patriots. That's the historical term. And so the left does something called projection. They blame us for what they're doing. Lo and behold, they're the ones that want to institute a nationalism. It's a woke nationalism and they don't care about your rights they want to get you canceled get you to lose your job get you kicked out of the military if you don't surrender your conscience to the state if you don't bow when nebuchadnezzar blows the trumpet right they don't care about your rights and, and there so in the in the bible potiphar's wife accused joseph of lusting after her when she was lusting after him mm -hmm. so it's called projection the guilty party will accuse the innocent party of being guilty. And so this is what they do. They want a theocracy, but it happens to be a Satanist type of theocracy. They want a transgender dominionism, right? You know, Christians don't want dominionism in that sense. They want freedomism. Just give us our freedom of conscience and freedom of, give us all the freedoms and, and let us be a government re of the representative of the people. We just don't want the government forcing its views on us and our children. We want the, the freedom. And we're happy to grant freedom to other people. Just don't use your freedom to force us to have to give up our views. You know, I've, I've said for years now, when all you've got left is name calling, you've lost the argument. So when all they can do is call me a Christian nationalist, hey, you've, you've got no argument left. It's proof that you don't have an uh, any any evidence or proof. You're just calling people names, and that's childish, you know. So you're you're right. So we've got a couple minutes left before we run out of time. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, you know. So we there's a lot more to this to this book. Uh, you know, just looking at the uh, at the table of contents, freedom of conscience, and and you know the covenant church and uh, the church influence. There's a lot of very interesting in. Uh, information in here. I, I love that idea. You talk about silence equals consent. Talk about that for just a couple minutes before we run out of time, please. Yeah. So it's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T. -T, and it's in debt collection law. Somebody owes you money. 
you wait 10 years to try to start collecting, the judge will say, you're past the statute of limitations. You've been silent too long. No money. It's in trademark law. You design a trademark and lo and behold, somebody copies it. It's all over the internet. If you don't try to defend your trademark, they get to use it. It's in real estate law. You save up money, buy a rent house. Some squatter moves in. And if you know about it and you're not trying to charge a rent or evict them, they can gain title to your rent house. It's called adverse possession just by you being silent. It's in our constitution. Article 1, Section 7. Congress passes a bill, puts it on the president's desk. If any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days, the same shall be a law in like manner as if he had signed it. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, all he has to do is let it sit there on his desk and be silent for 10 days, and his silence equals his signature. Why is this important? Um, believers, you know, um, Numbers chapter 30 is the silence equals consent chapter. Uh, there's half a dozen obscure stories. One is if a daughter's still living in her father's house in her youth and binds herself with a vow, and the day the father hears it, if he's silent, her vows stand. But if he disallows it, she's released from the vow. That's come down to us as vows in a wedding ceremony. And the pastor tells the church members, if you're silent when you hear these vows, you're giving your consent to the vows. Speak now, forever hold your peace. peace. So if a church member's silence gives consent to wedding vows, it gives consent to other things. And if they're killing babies in the community and the church members are silent, they're giving consent to killing babies. It's as if they're the ones killing the baby. They're an accessory to the crime. They have a tactic to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. You say, what? They say, yeah, if you're really Christian, you'll be silent and give your tacit approval to us teaching something to children that Jesus would never teach to children. Would Jesus teach the trans agenda? You can be a boy today, a girl tomorrow. You can be a fuzzy. We know what Jesus taught, Matthew 19. He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Yeah. If they're saying, if you're really Christian, you'll be, give your tacit approval and be silent while we teach your kids something Jesus would never teach. So if you're really Christian, you won't act like Christ. Yet yeah. Jesus, I mean, think of it. Here are teachers who cannot even define woman. If they think they can tell that a little boy is supposed to be a little girl, you can't even define girl. It's, it's insanity. And Jesus it, said, if you allow one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, better than a millstone we put around your neck and you'd be thrown in the depths of the sea. So it's going to be a rude awakening for all those church members who are not being involved. Oh, we just preach the gospel. We don't get involved in politics. We're so spiritual. We don't care what kind of country we're leaving our kids. It's going to be a rude awakening when they realize by their silence, they are giving consent to every evil thing that's going on out there. And they will be judged as an accessory to the crime. Leviticus William, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I've run out of time. Thank you so much. The book is called Silence Equals Consent, The Sin of Omission. I'll have a link on the show page when it goes to, uh, when it hits the show page in a couple of days. William, thank you for your time. I, I have a feeling you and I could sit down and talk for days and not cover all the topics we could. But I do appreciate you taking the time today to come speak with us. Well, thank you for having me on. And uh, AmericanMinute.com is my website. Excellent. I'll put a link to that as well. 